warming up here, just a few announcements. If you didn't get your Lent devotional this morning, we do still have more. So you can go ahead and grab that. And if you do think you want one, we'd encourage you to go ahead and get one today. And that way, if we need to reorder more, we can get them coming. I think we have enough. But uh, we went through 19 this morning. So that was pretty good. But we ordered 30, so I think we're okay. We have ours. Wonderful. Um, tonight is the last night for Alabaster. So that's the other announcement to make. And um, also the uh, Nazarene Global Week of Prayer starts today. So I'll be sending out that email um, so you can hear it. But I thought we could actually talk about it as part of our opening prayer. So I'm going to bring that up real quick. So I'd like to just read this note from the Board of General Superintendents, which just kind of introduces the week. It says, throughout the last two years, the church has been greatly impacted by the global pandemic. While the church has been affected, we've also seen the ways in which the church has been able to shift and lean into new patterns of ministry as we seek to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. Often on the front lines, our pastors are in need of our prayer and support. They are growing weary and need the encouragement of our Lord, but also of God's people. Let us also remember our district superintendents, our field strategy coordinators, and our regional directors in our prayers. They are all adjusting their work to continue to be effective ministers of the gospel. Our world is in on discipleship from prevenient grace to saving grace to sanctifying grace is formational in the lives of our people. Across the age spectrum, we minister to those who need to know Jesus Christ, whether small children in a refugee camp in Africa or the one who is set free from bondage in the United States. God is at work. We need to pray for expanded avenues of discipleship around the world. We pray that the Lord will help us to continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. There are many obstacles these days, including government restrictions and the difficulties in obtaining legal documents. At the same time, we're called to For some, it is in your local community, whereas others are called to cross cultural borders to tell others about Jesus Christ. Mario and Irma Martinez answered the call and left their home in South America, traveling to the continent of Africa to serve as missionaries. God has used them in a powerful way to impact the communities that they serve for Jesus Christ. So specifically today, we can pray for the pastors in our denomination, which I greatly appreciate, our district superintendents, our field strategy coordinators, and specifically this missionary couple, Mario and Irma Martinez, who are from South America and serving in Africa. And each day there will be another focus. Um, both broad and narrow, as I believe how the pattern we're going to be following. So some topical prayers like pastors and leaders, but also specifically calling out missionaries or leaders or, or members of churches each, each day. So the Martinez family and then different leadership. Um, as far as our circle down here in uh, New Jersey, do we have any prayer requests? I do have a few from this morning. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the Bradford family. Um, some of you might know Judy Bradford. She attended the River Church. Uh, she is also on the steering committee for Salem County Women for Christ. So she was a friend of Jane's. So we're praying for their family and their loss. Um, we're lifting up Bonnie's family. She has a few different family members who are dealing with some troubles right now. So we're praying for them. Uh, we're also thankful for safe travels back home for Bonnie and Wendy. She was able to go and visit with, um, well, she and Wendy were traveling and they got to meet up with Bethany and Amy and they got to see Bethany's new baby. So Bonnie was very excited to get to meet her newest grandbaby. Um, let's see, I'm gonna pray for Ralph Smith. He's dealing with some significant health problems. Eva Lee has asked us to pray. She applied for a new job, well, a new promotion at her job, to be a trainer. 
And so if she gets this job as a trainer, she will be able to have a little bit less physical stress on her body. Let's see, my mom has joined us. Hi, mom. We are just taking prayer requests if you happen to have any. I know it looks like I just called Bethany mom, but it's just because you're near the camera. <laughs> um, Xavier. I mean, I don't know if it's still the cold, but he's got allergies too. And It happens sometimes. I wait till I get home and I have a Nazarene I almost had one today, but it didn't quite happen. But they are nice. Mm -hmm. I have that every day. Every day? <laughs> I did. Man, I, I can't wait. <laughs> You got a fire end in that? We have a uh, fireplace. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's nice. My husband took very good care of me while I was post stop and everything. Amen. Amen. Yep. Uh, a couple others we want to pray for the Goslins. Uh, my sister Michelle home too. Well, hello, Michelle. It's a family. <coughs> We pray for the Goslins. Charles is still dealing with some health troubles. Uh, Eva Lise has asked us to pray for her son-in-law uh, back in Puerto Rico, her daughter's husband. He was in a motorcycle accident this week, and he did have to have some pretty major surgery, had to have some screws and pins. Um, so he is in quite a bit of pain. I mean, they're thankful that he made it through the accident. You know, motorcycle accidents are quite dangerous, but um, please pray for his recovery and for the pain he's dealing with from the surgery. Also, her grandson, who is only one and a half, he's been having fevers regularly. They think he might have an upper respiratory infection, but they're not sure. He doesn't seem to have a lot of other symptoms, but he keeps getting this fever. Um, so please pray for her grandson. And also, her son Joseph starts his new job this week. So that's a, that's a big praise. So we had been praying. He came up and interviewed for the job at the surgical center, mm -hmm. and he gets to start this week. So that means he is moving up here permanently now to, to New Jersey. So both of her sons will now be close to her. So that's a good thing. Uh, Pastor, can we keep praying for Janice? Yeah. Anyone else? I'd like to give thanks to God on Carol on my behalf because feeling pretty sick. Our throats were sore. We had a little bit of a fever. and Of course, as usual, we were worried that in my condition, we were hoping it wasn't COVID. And she did one of the home tests that the government sent us, and thank God it was negative. So we prayed that God would help us get through the agonizing symptoms and the cold, so, uh, sore throat and the cold and all that. And two, three days, we were feeling much, much better. And I want to give praise to God for looking out after us. Amen. It's one of those times negative results are for celebration, right? Definitely. Yeah. We had a lot of things to do with the pantry. Yeah. Well, hello, Jane. Which reminds me we need to keep praying for Anchor's grandson, Dylan. Dylan, right? I have it right Anything else before we go to prayer? I don't know if I specifically mentioned it, but we are going to continue praying for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, there are, at least on the news this afternoon, they're saying there are rumors of uh, some kind of peace talk that might be happening. So let's hope that works out. What did we do? Did America do anything? Um, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that intelligently. Um, the short answer is, like, we don't have troops there right now, from what we've been told. We do have... Um, as far as I know, we and other NATO countries are sending military aid as far as weapons and things like that. Um, but I don't believe we have any troops on the ground, that's what you mean. And Our troops are just over there to support the NATO nations. Right. 
but everybody's kind of ramping up their levels of alert. So there are some NATO countries that border the area, right. and they've gone on. Getting their hackles up. So we need to get this settled down before it gets any worse. When you start dealing with countries with nuclear weapons, we yeah. you don't want yeah. anybody yeah. having a temper yeah. tantrum. Yeah. Yes. Keep your finger on that button. Yeah, so <laughs> let's uh <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Eric has also joined us. Hello, <laughs> Eric. So, yeah. I'll pray for Melinda that she could sell. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So that's exciting. Sasha has a new friend. <laughs> Let's pray again. Father God, we lift up our world today. Just looking at things that are happening all over the place, it reminds me that uh, we just have so very little control over things. But Father, it also reminds me of where our hope lies, where our trust lies, uh, that we never can trust in powers of this world to bring about peace. That we need your will to be done and your spirit to be poured out. And Father, I've been thinking a lot about the Lord's Prayer lately. About your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, that's our prayer. That your kingdom would come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We yearn for that day. Um, but like we read in scripture, we know that birth pains are not a comfortable process. And so... We endure because we hope. Mm -hmm. Father, we lift up the Bradford family in their time of loss. We pray that they would be comforted in their time of mourning. We thank you that Bonnie is home safe, and we thank you for the journey that she and Wendy got to go on, their time together traveling, and their time with Bethany and Amy and uh, Bethany's family and the new baby. Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you that even in the midst of trials, we can celebrate your life and the gifts that you bring us. Uh, Father, we lift up Edgar's grandson, Dylan. We lift up Carly and her baby. We lift up Ivelisse's grandson. We lift up Janice Lehman. Uh, Father, we lift up Venus's niece, all people who are struggling right now. Um, Father, we leave them in your hands. And we lift up the situation in Ukraine, Father, our hearts break for those who have died, those who are suffering, especially innocent children caught in the middle of adults having tantrums. See pictures of hiding in subways from bombs and children who are marching through the snow to try to get to a safe country. Uh, Father, we pray that they would be received with open arms and with love. pray for peace, Father. We pray that these talks that are coming would end the fighting and that people could handle their dispute with words. Father, we lift up Charles. Uh, Father, we pray that the doctors would find a way to get the fluid around his heart under control. And we pray for Donna and the rest of the family as they anxiously await him returning home. Father, we pray for Donna's heart as she misses her husband. Uh, we lift up Ivelisse's family. We thank you that her son-in-law made it through this accident. And Father, we pray for his recovery, his, his orthopedic surgery, and the pain that he's in because of those breaks. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, we pray that you would be with him in this time and that you would bring healing to his body. Uh, Father, we celebrate Joseph's new job that he is starting and Bethany's new job that she is starting. Father, we thank you for the arrival of, uh, of a new granddaughter. Well, not new, but we thank you that Melinda has arrived and is here safe with Jim and Carol. And uh, we thank you, Father, for being with them through their journey this week. 
that they were able to have a negative test and recover from their symptoms and be well and be able to come and serve at the pantry. Father, we lift up Xavier and others who are dealing with frustrating illnesses right now. We pray that you would bring healing to him and to the rest of us. Father, we lift up Xavier's family, his siblings and his mother, and we lift up other families in our circle who are having troubles right now, Father. We pray. We pray for hearts to turn to you, Father. We pray for hearts to turn to you. Please be with us tonight, Father, as we study our word, and, and, and we thank you that we can participate in um, what it means to be a part of a greater church family in this denomination. We thank you for these articles of faith that we've been able to study. We thank you for uh, this prayer email that we are able to participate in this week, the Global Week of Prayer. <coughs> Father, we pray especially for Mario and Irma Martinez, who answered your call to missions and left their home to go travel to another continent and share the gospel. Father, we thank you for Mario and Irma. We pray that you would keep them safe and that you would bless their ministry. We pray that you would help them to be salt and light in their community and that you would help them to share the gospel and care for compassionate needs where they are. Father, we lift up leaders in our church. We lift up pastors and district superintendents, field coordinators. Um, like the email said, it's been a hard couple of years. at your pleasure, Father, and we pray that you help us to do that well, that you help us to lean on you as we make choices, that you help us to lean on you for strength, and that you help us to share your heart as we serve. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I missed that. Charles is in the hospital? Um, yeah, he's been kind of in and out the last... And he had to go back, but basically, I think the short version is the fluid is coming into his heart as fast as they can get it out. Mm -hmm. And so they can get him to a spot where he's breathing okay and it starts working okay, but then the fluid fills, starts to fill back up again. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to get him to a place where he can be safe and comfortable and breathe. And that's one of the biggest things that when the fluid gets. I think I said hello to Eric, but if I didn't, hello Eric. So we have Eric and Jane and Michelle and Diane on with us. So uh, I guess we can get into our study now. Last week we finished our discussion on baptism, and this week we are discussing uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Now, pop quiz for those who were here last week. Why are these two the sacraments that we celebrate in the Church of Nazarene? They're for everyone. Yes, they're for everyone, and they are commanded. Right? Mm -hmm. These are two sacraments that Jesus told us to celebrate. In the Great Commission, he told us, what was that? At what time did they would break? Absolutely, and the, the gentleman who I quote, said it first. I've heard it quoted by many a preacher and teacher. Uh, after, do you happen to know who came up with that phrase first? Yes. It's, we'll quote it to that. Yeah, it is probably much older than Wesley. Yeah, we'll say, we'll <laughs> quote it to Anonymous. Uh, but it's a good, it's a good phrase. <clears throat> and it, it really does help distill down what we're talking about. It's an outward sign of what's going on. It probably time. originated in the uh, Reformation. Mm. Uh, because uh, there was certainly a lot more in the Catholic Church of, of baptismal regeneration, mm. um, and, uh, and 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 quite frankly, until the Anabaptists, there was not adult baptism for all believers. There wasn't such a thing as believers' baptism. Mm. Uh, so it it. Result, resulted out of at least the Reformation, perhaps even the, the radical Reformation, the Mennonites and um, 
for them and uh, others. So since we bring that up, it is important to know that when we say this is what the church believes, we're talking about this is what the Wesleyan holiness branch of the Protestant church today believes about it. Um, beliefs have changed over time. Um, one of the things we touched on last week was the idea that um, when the church was the Roman Catholic Church, there were seven sacraments, mm -hmm. and we've distilled that down. That was a big part of the Reformation. Also, part of our understanding about the elements of the sacraments, what they mean, how that grace is conveyed, that has changed a little bit over time. There was more focus on the physical act being an actual conveyance of grace rather than our idea that we're talking about now that it's an outward sign of an inward grace. So for instance, in our church, um, I don't, we treat the elements a little bit differently. Right? Um, if we were to drop a communion wafer on the ground, uh, we would not have to brush it off and hurry up and eat it. Um, that would be okay to get rid of. Um, some things like that. So, um, another issue which is going to come up tonight is about who can participate in these sacraments. Um, there have been many different ideas over the years about this. We are falling on what I guess we would call the inclusive side of it. Go back to baptism. Why did John the Baptist start to baptize? Okay, good question. Good question. So, the short answer is that baptism as an act of cleansing has been around for a very long time, and it was certainly around before John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. There are th there's more than one Jewish tradition of washing with water as a symbol of being cleansed. Um, the mikvah for women is, is one that I know of. Um, I, there are a lot more. Um, but John's preaching of repentance and water as a cleansing symbol of that repentance is where those ideas came together. It was a new use of this, this, this repentance separate from the temple. So it's a new thing, but it's also touching on an older thing. Right? It's taking an older tradition and combining it with something new. So the fact that he was doing the washing, that part's not radical. The fact that he was doing it um, away from the temple, away from sacrifices, that there was repentance without an animal sacrifice or a blood sacrifice, that that was a big change. But we see even in, in the words of John the Baptist that he talks about baptizing with water, and he says one will come after him who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so that's kind of the idea, right? That um, the actual water, that's... That's not the powerful part or the important part. It's the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of what we're praying for. Um, also, one of the important aspects of that kind of baptism is that it's public, mm -hmm. right? So, um, in, especially in the Protestant church today, we recognize baptism as uh, part of an initiation, as part of a public inclusion, a public statement. So whether it is the public dedication of an infant and the covenant that the parents take to raise that child as a Christian and the covenant that the church participates in in order to help or a believer's baptism as an adult where you are making a public profession of faith along with your baptism. They're both about a public initiation. So it's something that's done commonly out in the open and with other people present, much like a wedding, how you would have, even legally today, we still require witnesses for a wedding, but how you would have public witnesses. So, um, since you brought up the connection between older traditions of baptism and John the Baptist, let's start there with the Last Supper. Does anyone know the tradition that actually was being practiced, or the feast that was being celebrated on the night of the Last Supper? Passover. Very good. And when, what is the feast of Passover remembering? It's a Passover from the destroyer. They had to paint the blood on their doors. Um, so that the, their firstborns wouldn't be destroyed. Only like Egypt's firstborns were destroyed. Exactly. So it's commonly known as the tenth plague. Um, and uh, it's when the angel of death passed over the, the people of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And if the door was marked with the blood of the Passover lamb, the angel passed over. If not, the angel took the firstborn son of the household. Mm -hmm. And so that was the 
the celebration. So um, I'm not going to get all the details right, but parts of that celebration are um, the slaughter and boiling and consumption of the lamb, um, also the eating of unleavened bread with bitter herbs. You would celebrate with your coat on, your belt wrapped around, and your sandals on, ready to walk. So you're symbolizing that you're ready to leave. Now that has developed into the Passover Seder, which has several stages, and there are uh, leaving a seat for a prophet and uh, hiding bread and having the children find it, and several other um, traditions that I don't fully understand or remember. And I'm going to be honest about that. <laughs> I used to remember a lot more about those details than I remember right now. But, but yeah, they were celebrating the Passover meal. The people had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. And um, do you think that was just a coincidence, or do you think there was reasoning behind that? Yeah, there was reasoning. Yeah. And what might that be? What might be the symbol? Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. Jesus is the only pure, sinless sacrifice that will cleanse us of sins. The, the, the animal sacrifices, they had to do it over and over and over again because it didn't get rid of the sin. It just... Didn't do it. Excellent. So Jesus is both our high priest and the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. All right. Well, you guys have done your homework, so that's nice. When I worked at the Golden, they had uh, Orthodox Jews own it and run it. Mm -hmm. And they brought in some of that unleavened stuff. That, that's like even cardboard. <laughs> it kind of is. Yeah. It kind of is. Yeah. No yeast. Yeah, yeah, it's and a lot of churches still do that. We've had we've had communion with matzah here before. Right. Um, we're not quite as specific on the elements as some churches. Some churches use a a leavened loaf because you get the nice break and tear, and it looks nice. Um, not, I don't think that quite matches up with what they would have been doing at the Last Supper, though. No, they all have nice matzahs. Yeah. Well, there's onion flavor. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> I'd like to not I don't think that's good. But let's get into the article. This is number 13 if you happen to be following along. And uh, this is taken from the Manual of the Church of the Nazarene. So this one's a little bit shorter, just one paragraph. So let's get into this. We believe. And this is how they all start, if you haven't noticed that. We believe that the memorial and communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is essentially a New Testament sacrament, declarative of his sacrificial death, through the merits of which believers have life and salvation and promise of all spiritual blessings in Christ. It is distinctively for those who are prepared for reverent appreciation of its significance, and by it they show forth the Lord's death till he come again. It being the communion feast, only those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints should be called to participate therein. So, we actually have quite a bit of nuts and bolts details in this one. We believe that the memorial and communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's start there. How do we know that this is instituted by our right? when, when he celebrated that last supper, when he broke the bread, when he shared the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we'll read, we'll read that scripture in just a minute. Um, so it was instituted by Jesus. And it is a New Testament sacrament. It is a holy act. Now, what does it mean? The next word is declarative. What does it mean for an action to be declarative? What does it mean to declare something? Say it to, out state, loud. to state something as a fact. So I wear a wedding ring. What is that declarative of? That you're married. That I'm married. Right. So, what is the communion supper declarative of? The death of Jesus. Yeah, and that's the first phrase that's repeated. That is declarative of his sacrificial death. That the, the blood and the bread, or the, the body broken, 
represent his death. Okay? But thankfully, it doesn't just symbolize that, right? If it just symbolized his death, well, that would be a funeral feast, not a Thanksgiving feast. Right? Yes. So, we, we recognize that through his death, it, that we have life and salvation and promise of all resurrection. We remember the blessings and promise that come with his death. Um, there's a phrase that is used in the manual when we celebrate communion uh, that says that we take the elements to our soul's comfort and joy. That it brings comfort and joy to our soul to come together at the Thanksgiving table and remember Jesus. Yeah. Um, it is distinctly for those who are prepared for reverent appreciation of its significance. So what is reverent appreciation? What do you think that means? Non-frivolous. Not frivolous. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So what would it mean for me to come to communion prepared for reverent appreciation of its significance? To confess any, any issues that we might have and just pray that God will see our heart. Mm. The preparation of our heart, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the term appreciation, obviously all these words, they can very carefully choose you know, with, with all kinds of meanings. And when you think about it, well, you know, I'm, when you appreciate uh, uh, something of value, uh, you, you are looking at it with knowledge and with uh, uh, a conscious uh, valuing of, of that object. Um, you, you talk about appreciation of, uh, of various goods, uh, the appreciation of your house. Uh, hopefully it is appreciating and not depreciating. It has value. It has value and it's growing in value. And, you're, and there's an appreciation of that, the, that, it's, that it, it, it has value and grows in value. Um, I think the word is chosen because it's the together with reverence, like um, Bethany said. That, but it, the appreciation part of it is the is the consciousness uh, of what Christ did for you uh, versus what uh, what our Catholic and what our Lutheran friends would might might say to us that this is uh, uh, we're appreciating the the elements we're not appreciating the elements we're appreciating what the elements symbolize right so we're not <coughs> thankful for the juice and the wafer the power is not in the juice for, and the wafer we're right. thankful for jesus christ and the power is in his blood and respect so we have reverence also symbolizes respect so understanding respect like Darlene mentioned, where our heart is. And, and we'll get to this in, in a, it's, well, let me just read it and we'll talk about this all together. Um, that it is for those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints. So, should a person who does not believe Jesus Christ is Lord participate in communion? No. No. Should a person who does not know what communion is participate in communion? No. 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 Should a person who has sin or hatred in their heart for another brother or sister, should they participate in communion? Definitely no. no. So this is one of those times where we can talk about the negative to understand the positive. There are some in the Nazarene church that have pushed it towards putting more significance towards it being, I'm going to open up another can of worms here, but it's not me, means of grace. Uh, by that meaning, well, <clears throat> by coming to participate, perhaps you would come to Christ. Uh, the, 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 while I'm somewhat open to to any by all. There is too much of a danger 
with this that is so, so wrapped up in intention that you're, and too many falsehoods about it otherwise. It is not a magic pill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't, it, but when you come and, and uh, take a maybe this becomes your first act. And I'm open to that. Yeah, if, so when, if everybody does it, you risk it becoming meaningless. So We shouldn't be dropping it from airplanes and hoping it touches you and saves you. Yeah, because like it becomes just lip service. Okay, yeah, I did this. This is what I was supposed to do. Instead of, okay, I understand that this is you know the body of Christ and this is His blood. This is what they symbolize. Can you? The, when I'm holding these, I visualize what it would have been like standing in front of the cross. That's what I do. And I'm like I, I hold them and I'm looking at it like, what would it have been like if I was the disciples or Mary and he's right there, really not me just visualizing him, but he's really there. How would I feel in that moment knowing what he did for me? I think you could call that reverence. Yeah. 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 I think I we have. I think we've gotten a little lax in who we serve communion to. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're afraid we're going to embarrass somebody. You know, you're sitting in the room with a whole bunch of people, and then, you know, they say, you know, your heart should be right, and you know, the stipulations that are in the Bible for this, and then you have people on your your pew that don't take communion, then, you know. Mm -hmm. What about, like, my grandchildren taking it? Is, is that not... Well, let's get in. We'll, we'll, let's go down this path. So we're going to start figuring. We'll, we'll zoom in on the kids, the kid issue. So when we talked about Article Ten about sanctification, there was a word that was used there, subsequent, right? Mm -hmm. That sanctification could only occur subsequent to regeneration. You have to be born again before you can be sanctified. To, to use loose terms there. So I would argue that celebrating the Lord's Supper is something that would also need to be subsequent to regeneration. That Amen. you should not take the elements and then give your life to Christ. But you can give your life to Christ with the elements in your hand and immediately take them. Amen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you're preparing yourself. Right. So you should have given your heart to Christ. You should believe in Jesus before you take them. Yes. Now the level of understanding, that's an interesting topic, right? I'm, I'm ordained. Do I fully understand communion? No. I don't fully understand the mysteries of this act. Um, I've learned a lot about them. I know a lot more about it than I used to. But, to, you know, so what level of understanding is required for this? Um, you know, when we talk about someone being sick, we brought up that idea of the age of accountability. Mm -hmm. okay? So that there is a time when we did not understand what sin was and there was a time when we did understand what sin is I would say that's also a good marker for talking about communion if, if a person can't understand that Jesus died for them it's questioning whether this is something that they should participate in yeah I, I'd go even step further really need to know whether that young child knows the Lord or not. Right. And I think that's where I go with this too. And I, I want to, if I could add one yeah. more thing to that, because there's a trouble in our, in a lot of it, in the church, think, and all that's all they did. I just grew up in the church. Right. And, and when you grow up in the church, you grow up in all of its activities, including its most important activities. And you may or may not have um, uh, accepted Christ. Uh, that's where the parent's role comes in. Yeah. So, I'll use myself as an example. My grandmother brought me to church, um, like you bring your grandkids. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to take communion just because she did, and I'm sitting next to her, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, we can talk about children. We've even talked in this term, children as young as, let's say, five, giving their heart to Jesus. I think if you're old enough to pray that kind of prayer, you're probably old enough to participate in this sacrament. But a, me as a pastor, I can explain to you as, as the caregiver or guardian what this means, but you know your grandchild much better than I do. You had those conversations. You've prayed prayers with them. You've prayed over them. So you probably understand where they are in their journey much better than I do, or, or what they do or do not understand, or, or where their heart is. It's difficult with mine because I'm telling them the right way, and about Jesus, and about the sacraments, and, and you know, what it all means. But when they're home, they're being taught the opposite. You know, I'm trying to teach them to turn the other cheek, and they're being taught to fight. So, when it came to children, there was a tradition that you would not give communion to children for fear that they would take communion unworthily and suffer punishment or wrath because of that. Yeah. I don't, I personally don't fall into that side of things. I would not avoid giving communion to a child because I would fear that they are sinning. Because it's kind of one of those catch-22s. If you're not old enough to understand communion, are you old enough to be above the age of accountability right. and sin? Right. So I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you shouldn't let your grandkids take communion because God might strike them with lightning. <laughs> so much like um, we attach ages to things like marriage, right? And that's different in different cultural contexts, mm -hmm. even in different states of the United States is different, but we recognize that this covenantal act is something that should not be undertaken by a child who doesn't understand it. Um, but where exactly that line is, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to place exactly. Yeah. Part of where I fall on this is similar to baptism. I would want to talk to the child about it and, and see if they understand. If I ask a child, what does this mean? Why do we do this? And if they just say, I don't know, or I don't care, then they might not be ready to celebrate. But if they can say, we do this to remember Jesus, right? Or we, this reminds us that Jesus loves us, then I think we're getting much closer to that point of understanding reverently what it means. Yeah. Um, this is one of those things where the pendulum has swung back and forth in the church and, and in different traditions. And every child is different, too. You know? mm -hmm. This is also why, in some traditions, they do not give communion to people who are not members of the church. Because if a person is not a member of the body, you can't attest to that person's faith. Right? So, for instance, if, if a stranger walked into our church and I never met them, I would have no idea what they believe or not. Right. And maybe I, we didn't even get it. Maybe they walked in after the sermon started, and then we passed out communion. I don't even have a chance to ask them their name. You shouldn't participate in this. Also, there have been times in history when a sacrament like communion was weaponized, where it was intentionally withheld for not Christ-like reasons, sometimes for political reasons. And you know, we, don't want to, we don't fall on those extremes. Um, in the Church of the Nazarene, we came out of some of that. I think we mentioned this last week with baptism, but um, you know, John Wesley was an Anglican. He's part of the Church of England. And one of the things that happened here in the United States is when we had the Revolutionary War, when that occurred, the Church of England recalled all of its priests. So everyone who was ordained was recalled to England. And so there was no one left in the colonies who was ordained. And so then they had to figure out, well, what do we do? Can we, can we have weddings? Can we have communion? Can we, what do we do? And so, at least for us in our tradition, specifically in relatively recent history, this was an issue. Who can give communion? 
who should take communion. Um, in, in our denomination, we believe that communion should only be administered by someone who is ordained. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Sometimes we focus on the education part and all that, but really what we're saying is a person has professed a call to ministry from God, and that call has been affirmed by the body. That person has been trained and tested. This is kind of kind of an important step in a person's life. Um, yes. Yeah. When I, I, it's something we frame and look and, and treat with. <laughs> I know that some people are flippant and disrespectful about ordination. You know, you can go get ordained on the internet. Mm -hmm. But we in the Church of the Nazarene are pretty serious about ordination. Um, it is a years-long process. Mm -hmm. You cannot do it in less than years. Um, and I don't just mean your education. I mean, you have to be, you have to serve as a locally licensed minister before you can get a district license. And you have to hold that district license at least two years before you can um, be up for ordination. So you have to serve in the body for years. You have to be examined by your peers. You have to, that call has to be affirmed by your local church pastor, by your local church board, and by your district leadership. So we take it pretty seriously in the church of Nazarene. Um, and part of the reason is this is a serious act. Um, we don't want people to take communion in an unworthy manner. And so, the same way you might need a license to drive a car or to purchase a firearm, right? This is not something that should be taken casually. It should be a serious act. Um, can, can I talk a little bit about the unworthy? Part? Sure, and we'll, we'll get into scripture too in a little bit here. It sometimes focuses in, we focus in on the elements themselves and saying, well, the, you know, the, if they put it through their mouth or they, you know, they, you know, they're, they're taking it in and they, and they really shouldn't be because of sin in their heart or they haven't received Christ. Um, I, again, I'm very nominalist, uh, meaning I put... Uh, that those that's that's simply bread. That is simply grape juice. It, uh, it is that is uh, it is something I can throw away. I don't. You know, there's nothing mystical about those things. That's for me. But I fall on that side as well. But the act I'm saying to the congregation that I am. Uh, I am a follower of Christ, and I have Christ in me by taking this. Uh, uh, I'm not in practicing sin. I, I may not have been sanctified, uh, and we have oodles of unsanctified Christians who who still have inbred sin in them that are taking communion. Praise God. Uh, but when if but if I am in if I am practicing sin and holding sin and holding things against my my brother or sister and I'm taking this sin, I am lying before the congregation. And and that is uh, so serious that uh, the, the one the one example we have with people lying before the congregation didn't make it out the door. Yeah. And I think that's a really good way to frame it, the idea of lying. Um, the way this article in, in the slides, it talks about love for the saints. Right? So, if I have hatred in my heart, then by taking in the elements and saying that I am one with Christ. Um, 
because this is a public communal act, we are getting into that question of bearing false witness. Right? So the, the real Old Testament version of that, right? it's not just to lie, it's to bear false witness or bear false testimony. So to, to stand before the church and partake of these elements and say that I am one with Christ, when I know in my heart that there is sin and I am not one with Christ, that is bearing false witness. So to get into the nominalism statement just a little bit, um, we're Sorry talking for bringing it up. No, no, no. It's a, it's a good point. I was going to mention transubstantiation anyway. Um, the spectrum was kind of from transubstantiation over to nominalism. Well, it's trans, trans, right? The, for a substance to change into something else. Oh. No. So the idea being that when you take in the elements, they actually become flesh and blood in your body. Okay. okay. Even so far as there are some Catholic priests who say if you have a wheat allergy like me, it's okay to take communion because it doesn't stay as bread. It turns into flesh. Yeah. Um, which I guess it means you can't be vegan and take communion if you're Catholic. But, that's a little bit of a silly thing, but those are the two ends of the spectrum. So if you believe in transubstantiation and saying when I take these elements into my body, they become the flesh and blood of Christ, and if I'm a sinful vessel, that creates a deadly tension. right? And so that's what I think what Pastor Tom was getting at. This began as a, a fear of tainting the elements themselves, um, and also the disposal of the elements. And you know, you, you may know like the the leftover communion wine can't just be dumped out; it's consumed by the priest rather than you know being you know spilled out. Um, that these elements can only go into a body; they shouldn't go anywhere else, and it should only go into the body of the believer. That's why he ends up drinking all the wine. Right. And eating everything right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Which, honestly, I like grape juice, so I'd be okay with that. But we don't do that. Um, by, by the way, I heard that, yes. Oh, it is? I heard that, yes. Yeah. He was, he, he was a Methodist teetotaler. Yeah. He said, we got to stop this drinking of wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we're getting into some of the specifics of how we do it, which is a little bit out of the Oracle of Faith, but, but still in the manual. And that, that's one of the stipulations in the manual, that we use unfermented grape juice. Okay? So we're very clear that this, should, this is not alcoholic. Okay? Um, when you're on the nominalist side and you're saying we're not talking about holy elements, the actual elements aren't quite as important. If we used cran grape instead of Welch's grape, it would still be okay. If we use ShopRite grape juice from concentrate, that's still okay, <laughs> right? Um, but we don't use fermented grape juice. That comes from our heritage of ministry to people struggling with addiction. Do you bless the elements in any way? Do I do, I pray over the elements okay. before we hand them out, and then we also pray together before we take them. Okay. Don't get gluten free. If we can open them. Yeah, me too. I get the gluten free. Yeah. The, that's, I know, I know. There is, it's a, and this whole idea of the stamped styrofoam wafer that has become the norm, I don't know. Um, I like, you know, back before the the Rona hit, you know, um, as good communion stewards, I know Darren Charlene often used monster crackers. Um, I think that's a good way to do it. But I've been in churches that did all kinds of things. Um, I was in a church one time where we used oyster crackers. Because right? um, they're already convenient size and they're unleavened. Um, some places use saltines. Um, I know that uh, Pastor Murphy's wife, Rondlin, sometimes she would bake unleavened flatbread and get real traditional, <laughs> um, with bitter herbs in it sometimes even. So, you can. Uh, we're less focused on the bread part than we are the juice part, that it should be unfermented. And that's because of our stance on alcohol. That we would not want to intentionally encourage a recovered or recovering addict to consume alcohol. I remember when the uh, virus first started, I had a patient who was Catholic, they were Catholic, and the daughter told me that 
the Catholic Church was, had heard that a certain percentage of alcohol will kill coronavirus. So they were thinking of bumping up their... <laughs> Going to the high test <laughs> stuff? <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, that makes the whole drinking the leftovers a little bit tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And they do communion every day, so you know. Yeah. yeah I, I had a, uh, I, I had an instance uh, since I've been here. Of, normally, I know these things going into the churches. I, I wasn't as familiar with Orthodox Presbyterians. And uh, the, that uh, that particular uh, denomination of Presbyterians. No, I think number. I think all of them do. But uh, they're very they're very uh, evangelical, very conservative uh, in their theology. In fact, one of the original fundamentalist denominations uh, out of uh, uh, Westminster. And, uh, to uh, the, uh, the church and I was going to be speaking at their adult Sunday school after, after the service and, uh, but uh, the last act of the service was communion and I, you know, I've taken communion in a lot of congregations and was happy to and I took, took that uh, cup Got a surprise? I am not a real surprise. That's the only time I've ever had. Why in my life? And you can't spin it out. I can't spin it out. And I told him afterwards, I go, what in the world? <laughs> he goes, oh, you must have missed it. The, the uh, non-alcoholic proportion is in the center of the, of the plate. So that was that was uh, that was one of those experiences. So take communion at the children's table. <laughs> well, let's get into some scripture here. Um, I thought we could read from the Gospel of Matthew. That's one of the places where this is talked about. But Matthew chapter twenty-six, verses twenty-six through twenty-nine. Um, we can read through multiple different gospels if you like, but Matthew's the first one, so we'll start there. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Could somebody read that for us? I got it. Thank you. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. Amen. So there's a longer portion there that there's more conversation, but that's the Last Supper. The breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. And that is why we do it. Um, I want to mention, since we talked about the unworthy thing, let's Jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to read verses 27. We'll go short. 27 through 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. So when we talk about consuming the cup unworthily or in an unworthy manner, this is what we're talking about. We have to dig in a little bit and understand exactly what that means. Right? Um, because Paul says, examine your heart, I think this goes to what Pastor Tom was saying earlier, right? That the, the condition of my heart when I join at the table is very, very important. Um, if I have hatred in my heart, if I have unrepentant sin in my life, I need to confess that to God and repent of that first before I take the elements. Right? 
so that I don't bear false witness of being united with Christ when I am divided in my heart. So the state of your heart is really what we're talking about. Um, yeah. I don't mean that your emotions have to be wonderful. I've taken communion when in mourning before, even though it is a Thanksgiving feast. But uh, our heart has to be in the right place. This is not meant to scare you. This is not meant to make you afraid of communion. But it's to help us to understand the significance of what we do, that there is a reverence to it. We don't do this flippantly or disrespectfully. Um, no, you need to prepare yourself before you take of the elements. So pa different pastors do it different ways, but I always ask people to pray. I, I pray over the congregation, and I always ask the congregation to pray before we take the elements. Because I it's important to me that we're not afraid of the elements. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not afraid of communion. Uh, it is a time of rejoicing. Uh, it's a time of seriousness, but it's a time of rejoicing. Um, the, uh, but, uh, and I'm not an advocate for taking, uh, as some are, uh, taking communion every day. I, there's, uh, I, I see no reason for that, and I actually I think it's a practice of the body, not of individuals. Uh, for, first and foremost. Do we understand what he's meaning by that? This is not something that we do alone. This is a communal act that we do together. Yeah, we get it together. But we, um, uh, yeah, just just as you add the nativity before the cross for that length of time, uh, understanding of why Jesus came to be born. He was born to die. Mm -hmm. Um, that is something that we should at all times uh, be thinking about. We should have it before our face at all And we should, uh, if we have somehow, some way out of negligence left, uh, left something undone, like, like it says uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Leave our gift at the altar and go and reconcile. Yeah. So the table is meant to be a celebration, an invitation, a joining. And so, yeah, while we're being reverent, it's not about being afraid of doing it wrong. It's about receiving the joy of doing it right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so we covered some of the nuts and bolts. I didn't copy the full liturgy from the manual, but if you'd like to, I can give to you or show you, but those are some of the, the practices in the Church of the Nazarene that communion is um, officiated by an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene. Um, now, we have communion stewards, so um, you'll often see in this church where um, whether it's um, like when we do the, the big trays with the cups that we pass around, I'll pray the blessing and then I'll hand a tray to multiple stewards. Now they don't need to be ordained, as long as there is an ordained person kind of overseeing things. Right. In, in our church, um, we are generally, we would have mature believers who are members of the church as communion stewards. So I wouldn't call a stranger to be a communion steward, um, because it is a, a, an important act. We use um, some form of bread. Um, I'm a little bit traditional in that I, I like to use unleavened bread as much as we can. And yeah. why is that? Because of the Passover practice, right? And that they use an unleavened bread because they did not have time to put yeast into their bread. They had to hurry up and make it. And, and they were told not to take any yeast with them. Right, and that's why they had all their clothes ready. They were ready to go. Mm -hmm. So, that's what, if, if we're looking at what Jesus did, he, mm -hmm. it would have been unleavened bread. It wouldn't have been a big loaf of Italian bread. Yeah. 
And, and I'm not saying that it doesn't count if you do it that way. I'm not, I'm not being a hater there. Just as a pastor, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to be close to that. I also recognize that Jesus probably shared a cup that had some alcohol in it. Maybe not as high of an alcohol content of what you might have in a bottle of red wine today, but it would have had some alcohol. It would have been at least partially fermented or a fermented wine that was mixed with either water or unfermented grape juice. Um, but that's kind of where we go with that, that it's unfermented and, and that we celebrate, again, what we call open communion, where you don't have to be a member of this church to partake, but you do need to be a believer. Right, that this table is for people who have accepted Christ as their Savior. So that's kind of where we go as a church. Um, and this is taking two different parts of the manual. We're taking the article of faith here, and then I'm also talking about, from the ritual section, the, the explanation of how we do that. Those are the two parts I'm putting together here. Now, of course, the leaven has that, uh, the lack of leaven has that, uh, or the bread has that secondary thing that we're to do this until he comes. He's coming soon. So we gotta be ready to, to move. Right. That we celebrate he's coming again. Yeah. So we remember, we remember that he died, we remember that he rose, and we celebrate that he's coming again. So we can talk about some different words that have been used for this meal. Um, and this is from an article writ written by Rob Staples. But um, he talks about uh, five different assertions, or five different truths that we affirm about the meal, and then some different uh, things the meal has been called over time. So I'm going to address these two topics real quick. Um, so truths that we affirm when we come to the table. One, the supper is a, commemor a commemoration in accordance with Christ's words. Do this in remembrance of me. And he specifically quotes Luke 22, 19 there. Um, that we are doing this because we were told to by Jesus. Two, that this supper is a celebration in which we give thanks for our redemption. Mm -hmm. So one of the words that we use is Eucharist, which is from the Greek meaning to be thankful. So it is a Thanksgiving meal. Right? We are giving thanks. Um, the third thing he talks about is that the supper is a presentation in which we offer ourselves <coughs> as living sacrifices. So, and I like this quote, he says, the invitation to Christ's table is a call to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And that last part's a quote from 1 Peter 2, 5. So we're not just taking in Jesus' sacrifice and remembering his sacrifice, we're also recognizing our call to take up our cross and follow him and what that means. And we're doing that together as a body so that we can support him. Four, the Eucharist is a participation in the blood and body of Jesus Christ. He quotes 1 Corinthians 10 here, um, but that it is a fellowship or a sharing or a participation. And we just read the passage in 1 Corinthians 11 about taking it in an unworthy manner. Mm -hmm. um, and he makes this note, which I like, and this is when we were talking about fear, I was thinking about this. He says, in honesty, no one is ever really worthy to be invited to Christ's table, right? As a human being, none of us are worthy, but it's by God's grace that we are invited. So amen to that. And he says, his definition is, to eat unworthily is to eat without recognizing the truth of Christ. Right. To deny Christ as you take. I think that's a good working definition of it. And he says that five, which we were just mentioning, that when we partake of the supper, it's a, a means of anticipation as we look forward to the end of the age. He calls it an appetizer for the final wedding feast of the Lamb. <laughs> which I think is an interesting way to look at it, right? But we're celebrating that time that's coming. Um, communion comes from the Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship or community. So we use We know if we look at some history of the early church, um, like for instance some of what Paul writes about in his letters to the Corinthians, they would have basically a potluck as their communion. Right? So they would bring food together and they would all eat a meal together as their Thanksgiving dinner. And part of their issue of being unworthy is that some people were 
hurrying up and getting there and eating all the good food for everybody to get there. They were drinking guzzle in the wine, getting drunk. Uh, the rich people were eating all the good stuff and not sharing with the poor people. That kind of stuff. Which I think is unworthy, right? It's not in a loving manner. Right? So the communal aspect of this is very important. Um, he has a little bit of a Q&A, which we covered some of this already, but um, we covered the different terms, Lord's Supper, Lord's Table, Communion, Eucharist, uh, Communion, Quinine, and we talked about that. Um, who is qualified to administer the Lord's Supper? Ordained elders um, and deacons um, are, quali I think I may have said only, I think I said elders when I quoted before, but ordained deacons are also allowed. Um, and that's, that's a denominational thing that's in our manual. That's not a scriptural thing. Um, who may participate? And I'll quote him here. Some churches practice offer open communion to anyone. In the church of Nazarene, all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and have believed in Christ on quote from section 802 of the manual, which is what I read from when I, when I hold the little black book, when I read it from. That, that's, this is part of what I quote. And then the question of what do we believe about the elements. Um, we do not believe in a supernatural transubstantiation that the, the juice is turned into blood or the wafer is turned into to flesh. Mm -hmm. um, we are, as Pastor Tom mentioned, nominalists. So we believe that the juice is juice and the bread is bread, but it's God's grace that's important. Um, there's a question of how the elements may be presented. And there's this note here that we use unfermented grape juice and it, we're encouraged to use unleavened bread or wafers. The cup may be individual or common and distribution may be from a central or multiple locations or passed for eating and drinking in unison as a congregation. Um, when we do a common cup, we usually don't drink from the cup. We usually, uh, yes, we practice a, uh, a form of communion called indinction, where you dunk it, right, and no double dipping. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, that's don't go too deep. Like Your it. fingers don't need to go in the cup. Let's just put that out there. So, you know, you're not... There's no extra blessing. Yeah. <laughs> so, the volume of juice is not as important. Um, and then the last question, which Pastor Tom kind of touched on, how often should it be observed? Well, the Bible doesn't really tell us about frequency. Okay. Um, up until the 16th century, it was common in the church to celebrate communion weekly. Since the Reformation, um, there has been no universal pattern of frequency among Protestant churches. So some Protestant churches do celebrate communion every single week. Some Protestant churches stretch it out and may only do it at times like Easter and Christmas. Some, some Protestant churches, like uh, in the Salvation Army, actually don't celebrate communion. So there are some differences of opinion. Um, we celebrate it roughly once a month. I tend to skew that a little bit to match up with some holy days sometimes. So um, we would often celebrate on the first of the month. I plan on serving communion at our Ash Wednesday service, which is March 2nd. So it's not the first Sunday of the month, it's Ash Wednesday. We also had communion, um, for instance, at our Christmas Eve service. Good Friday. Good Friday. Well, <coughs> one of them days. So I tend to, in those months where there is a holy day like that, I tend to shift it a little bit to, to match up with those times. Um, yeah. So I think that pretty much covers, we talked about words and scripture and practice and then the church and then any questions about communion? Take it unless you would. Take it unless you're Unless your heart's right. Worthy is a tricky word, because like Ross people said, is any human worthy? Mm -hmm. And uh, about that, my translation is a modern English one, mm -hmm. and it actually says, the passage of Redis, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like the part of the crown that jeers and spits on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance that you want? So did you hear that? Uh, Bethany's reading from uh, a, a modern interpretation of scripture. 
that it's like when we take it take communion in an unworthy manner, it's like the crowd who irreverently spit on Jesus. That's a disrespectful act or disdainful act. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, irreverent, disrespectful, disdainful, mocking. Yeah, should be done respectfully. Yeah. And we do have funny things that happen with communion. I was helping serve communion in another church. I got called up to help. And they were using a giant loaf of bread. And a little boy came up, and he took a chunk of bread about the size of a baseball. <laughs> right? And he dumped the whole thing into the cup, pulled it out, sticks out his tongue, touches it, says, I don't like grape juice, and handed it to me. <laughs> so I hurried up and grabbed it and stuck that hand under the cup I was holding. And I'm trying to keep the juice from dripping on the carpet. And I had this giant licked on chunk of bread on the no. So we had an interesting conversation with his parents after that. But I don't think he understood what he was doing. But uh, we're a family, right? And sometimes silly things happen in the family, and we learn from them, and we grow together. Um, advice that was given to me by one of my mentors, Jonathan Murky, was... Um, he said, I would rather give grace where it's not deserved than withhold grace when it should be given. So he errs on the side of offering communion if a person says that their heart's right. So we take a person's word for it. Um, if, you, take if, person's word for it. Um, if you tell me you believe, I accept your word, and that's between you and God. When we would, uh, I would ask my Sunday school class, have you done anything bad this week? <laughs> and the kids are like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> You couldn't think of a thing they did. You know, yeah. We wanted them to ask Jesus to forgive them. And, you know, they yeah. volunteer the thing. Their hand was. Yeah, and I don't. You know, <laughs> this, uh, I mean, you know, I try to be non confrontational in these things. <coughs> um, if a parent brought a child up and I wasn't sure if they were worthy, I wouldn't pick a fight in the middle of the aisle. Uh, no. Right? I might have a conversation with that afterwards and talk about what we might do the next time. Right. But I'm not going to make a big spectacle in front of everything. I'm sure your brands know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, they had all pressed in seminary <laughs> who as a pastor did refuse <laughs> someone at the altar to take I know a pastor who yeah. has done that. Yeah. A colleague of Rob Staples. Yeah? yeah. I know a pa I also know, I wasn't there when it happened, but I know a pastor who if I know a person has hatred in their heart, I might I might tell that person you shouldn't do this right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I haven't had to do that yet, but yeah. and that's a touchy subject, and that's why you have to be careful and respectful. You know, saving face is not our goal in worship, right? So that's an important part of this. Yeah. Well, since our teens have joined us, I uh, I think we can close in prayer now. It's seven twenty. It's seven twenty. Oh no, we learned about Jesus. Every night. I know. We're five extra minutes. It's terrible. Everything's been late. I thought we were going to have to start service leave. Worky had so many alabaster boxes to put in there this week. Aww. <laughs> that was, that was, that's, 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 You're getting pointed at. <laughs> that was a good thing. No, that was a good point. That's that a good a thing. thing at all. Not a bad thing. She <laughs> they just kept coming. I was like, wow, this is like the loaves of fish. I fill the church up. But, thank you. Um, okay, I guess we can pray together now, right? Yes. I heard you guys were doing the last session in your prayer series tonight. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did you talk about? Prayer. Prayer, okay. <laughs> 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 it's been the answer for seven straight weeks. <laughs> Have you gotten to the amen yet? <laughs> <laughs> my child, <laughs> and it's my child. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically, what did you? 
difficulties in prayer. Oh, like trifling children who get on your nerves? <laughs> no. No? Like what? Yell at you on Facebook. That's true. My mom is on Facebook, and so is Aunt Michelle. Well, and you're teasing me. <laughs> so I'm telling my mom. I'll hit you. Mom, she's being mean to me. So difficulties in prayer, what do you mean? Difficulties. Go ahead, Josiah. Like things that hinder you during prayer or distract you in some way. Like Distractions, you know. Yeah. word for word as <laughs> my dog does just I have to shut her out of the bedroom when I'm doing my devotion sometimes. When she's nuzzling me for a treat, I'm trying to read my Bible. That's just Josiah, you want to start us off? You're going to dial? Okay. Who's going to give us our amen at the end? Well, thank you, Miss Jill. You can give us our amen. And then we'll have some openings in the middle for Miss Annika or Miss Gorky or Mr. Avery to pray. How's that? Good? He's right here. He's, his head's just below pew level. So he's... <laughs> All right. So, wait, who's starting us off? Decide. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's pray to Jesus. Dear Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, wonderful thing that you've given us of salvation. We are we are very daily basis of uh, how unworthy we are, but at the same time, how joyful we are that that uh, Jesus, you call them brothers, and you call us brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're grateful that You sacrificed yourself for us. And it was terrible. We're reminded that even tonight there are those who are perhaps uh, sacrificing themselves, maybe laying down in front of tanks. And mm -hmm. There are Christians that are putting their bodies over little children as bombs drop protecting orphans. There are Jewish people and other people who need to know who you are mm -hmm. that uh, are fearing for their lives as well. We pray that you would uh, be with the, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. That you would help them to stand. Mm -hmm. it, uh, we don't know how to pray for them precisely, but we, we do pray that you would help them to stand mm -hmm. in this time of trial. And we pray that there would be brothers and sisters in Russia who would also stand. Mm -hmm. And that uh, evil might not have any sway at all. Mm -hmm. And especially not in the church. Pray that you would uh, protect. 
exactly what you promised, and you will help. And we know you are answering prayers. Father, thank you for inviting us to this table. Thank you for loving us and for forgiving us. Thank you for adopting us as your children. That word, Father, thank you, it doesn't do justice, but, but we thank you. We live because of you. We are saved because of you. We have hope because of you. Thank you. Thank you for the people who shared the gospel with us and helped us to come to know you. And thank you for the opportunity to invite others into your family. Father, thank you for being present with us. And thank you for the sacrament of Father, that you promise to hear and answer these prayers, even when we feel distracted and even when we feel distant from you. Um, all the things that the youth talked about tonight, um, we know that you are bigger than those challenges, and we're so mm -hmm. thankful that um, even, even when prayer doesn't come easy for us, you are always waiting and you're ready to listen as soon as we're ready to talk to you and thank you for that Lord I just pray for each person here um, and uh, who's listening online I just pray that as we get back into our routines tomorrow at work and school that you'll help us to make that time to spend with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
Well, thank you, everyone. Have a blessed night. Uh, next week, we will be talking about divine healing. So that's an exciting one, too. Um, we will be mentioning anointing as well. So, uh, and, uh, thanks for joining us. <laughs> we knew. It was just cute.